Good afternoon. I hope you guys can hear me well. Hi, I'm Jay Shire uh, from Esperanto. I'm excited to be here. And uh, on behalf of uh, our founder and CTO, Dave Ditzel, and members of Esperanto team, uh, we want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to share our experiences using Risk V for Generative AI. The talk is going to be split in three parts. Uh, to begin with, uh, we want to show the high-level challenges uh, that the growth of Generative AI has posed. We follow it up with Esperanto's approach and strategy uh, in tackling these challenges. And we conclude with a few of the lessons we have learned along the way and recommendations for the Describe community. The Generative AI has exploded in the last couple of years. Um, the buzz and excitement that it has created based on the wide range of applications and use cases it enables uh, certainly is good news for everybody, uh, you know, for the enthusiasts, developers, the technological community, everyone. But it also brings along with it real unique set of challenges. This slide shows the first two of those challenges, the memory wall and the compute wall. The foundational model sizes uh, that have been instrumental in this revolution of Gen AI, they have been growing at a rate of over 400x every two years. While the DRAM capacity that is required in order to hold the model parameters have been growing only at about 2x every year. This is what leads to the memory wall. At the same time, the throughput requirements of these LLMs, or the flop requirements of these LLMs, have been growing at about 10x every year, while the computational capabilities of the accelerators, like GPU, have been growing only at 10x every two years. This leads to what we call the compute wall. So as it's evident, the compute and the memory technology has not been able to keep pace with the growth of generative AI. The high demands of compute and memory of these models, they have a direct impact on a third very important factor, which is the power. The power to run systems that needs to be used to deploy and run these AI models. The data center's power demand has been rapidly growing in the last several years, especially for gen the AI model development and deployment. This chart shows this power demand trend. And as you can see, it has gone up by about 8x from 2015 till now. Major tech companies are actively seeking for alternate sources of energy to meet these demands. For example, Microsoft, Google, Meta, who all have hyperscale data centers to deploy and run these models. Right. This chart also shows a very interesting trend in terms of the intersection that is shown here. It is the intersection of Gen AI, uh, the power demand, and the environmental issues that they have, they're causing. Right. And as you can see, it has been steadily growing. So this growth path is unsustainable in the long term. We finally give a very high level view of the differences in the deployment process for the traditional AI models, which kick-started this AI revolution, and the Gen AI models, which have exponentially increased the scope, the applicability, and the use cases it enables. Overall, the quality of data and the quantity of data both significantly impact the overall cost of training these models and deploying them, because they have a direct impact on the cost of hardware needed, as well as the cost of engineering resources, the skilled labor that is required in fine tuning, mining this data. Right. So it is no surprise that the generative AI models are a lot more expensive to train and deploy, both in terms of the dollar value as well as the hours required, right? the days required, the months required to train them. Additionally, the very large models are typically deployed, and the, the model life cycle is usually controlled by the large um, public cloud providers. In case of the traditional AI models, the end users used to deploy and control these models. 
So the trends that we have seen so far, they raise very interesting as well as serious questions. How to economically train these models? How to cost effectively run them? And how to manage this ever-growing demand of power? In this next part, we want to describe Esperanto's comprehensive approach and strategy in leveraging the hardware and software that we had developed originally for the traditional deep learning models and how we extended it to address the latest challenges of Gen AI. This chart just shows a brief history of the evolution of Esperanto's ML software development stack. We originally started, as I mentioned, uh, accelerating computer vision models and recommendation models. And when the mo world moved to this more larger and more complex transformer-based Gen AI models, thankfully because of our hardware software core design based on RISC-V general purpose cores, we were able to quickly adapt and respond to the new challenges, and we were able to run the smaller large language models, the SLMs as they are called, which are shown here. Additionally, we were able to develop demos uh, for a wide range of applications and use cases through our Delphi initiative. Our initial focus was on small batch, low latency generative AI applications, focus at the edge. Now, this is where RISC-V helps. We have seen that the model architecture is constantly evolving, right? From the deep learning models that we saw several years back to the Gen AI models that we see now. Gen AI models, one, they are larger, needing more memory and compute. Two, they are more complex. For example, the deep learning models for computer vision and recommendation, they were comprised of simple convolution layers, which, does, which did the linear operations. And in some cases, like in the recommendation models, you had the embedding layers, which had sparse memory accesses. Now come to the generative AI models, which are transform-based, which support variable context lengths, which have much larger and diverse structures, needing more larger data transfers and compute. There is no way for us to predict what the building blocks of the next AI models in a few years would look like. But what we can say, and thanks to the fundamental approximation theorem, is that most of these models are going to do linear operations. Right? So we need compute solutions which are general purpose enough that can adapt and respond quickly to these changing demands of the AI models. Right? Using RISC-V, we have built such a general purpose architecture. We are able to adapt and quickly respond to different layers and operators that these new generation of models bring. And we are also able to achieve our performance objectives. This slide outlines Esperanto's comprehensive approach and the strategy in optimizing these generative AI models for this fire architecture. It shows our um, Gen AI development framework as well as the potential real-world applications that it can enable. Our first generation inference accelerator called ETSOC1 had 32 gigabytes of LPDDR4 memory. In order to be able to fit these models effectively and fine-tune our software stack, we consciously decided to focus on the smaller, open, large language models like Mistral, 5.3, Llama X series, Gamma, Whisper. In this way, we can use the power of our compute to be able to continue refining and fine-tuning our software stack. At the heart of this development framework is our AIML SDK, which is a collection of tools for developers to develop their models. When the models are predictive, they can be migrated to Onyx. Our Onyx runtime has an Esperanto provider, which utilizes our ML compiler in order to further do model optimization and code generation. The end result is an optimized implementation of the original network. We also, based on our SDK, 
uh, supported, uh, rather developed demos for a wide range of applications, starting from data center class web-based inferencing to real-time edge uh, applications like in robotics. Um, with the help of these fine-tuned models that we can actually run, we continue to evolve in terms of the fine-tuning of our software stack. This table just summarizes a subset of many of the networks with different precisions that we have analyzed, studied, and run. And this list is only growing. This is only a subset. Now, coming to an optimization technique, we're using block quantization as an example. So as we have seen, even the smallest of the LLMs, they require billions of parameters that need to be fetched from memory. Even after implementing strategies like key value cache to support different context lengths, it still remains largely a memory bound problem. In our studies, what we've observed is even with 100% memory bandwidth utilization, the compute cores still spend most of the time waiting for the data to arrive. That's where the quantization techniques help, block quantization in particular. What does the quantization do? It essentially takes the weights and the constants of a network and lowers the precisions to store them in smaller data formats, for example, in four. This leads to a direct 4x faster fetching of data. Based on implementing this technique across various networks that I described, we have been able to get a speed up of around 2.4x with further room for improvement. We need to also implement an efficient dequantization kernel in order to realize a full gain by which we can overlap compute and the data prefetch, which we discuss next. This is the dequantization kernel implementation in our first inference accelerator ETSOC1. The diagram here shows uh, the operation with the formula there. On the right-hand side, we have rows of quantized vectors in info. We also have offsets and scales which are required in order to realize a dequantization of these weights, which are also in info. Interesting thing to notice here is the several rows of these quantized weights actually just need a single row of scale and offsets. Now, the ISA support that is required. When we started development of our ETSOC1 ISA, or the development of our ETSOC1 accelerator, RISC-V did not have a vector extension. But thankfully, because of the flexibility of the ISA, we were able to do our own SIMD implementation. We extended the floating point registers to eight 32 bit lanes. We had arithmetic and logic operations that are capable of working with the SMD registers in flow 32 and in 32 precision. We did not have, we, or rather, we do not have support for operating them at FP16 precision. We also had our own tensor extensions, which support loads and stores uh, using the SMD registers. Along with it, we have matrix multiplication operations and transposition operations. We have a quantization unit, which does simple sequences of these arithmetics, converts, saturation operations over these multiple registers. On the right-hand side, you can see what, how many instructions and what is the register space usage to realize this implementation of this dequantization kernel. So for example, loading one cache line worth of quantized data it takes about 40 instructions and occupies about 16 registers. Similarly, loading the offsets and scales, it takes about 140 instructions. We perform the com computation in FP32 inside our quantization unit, which takes about 11 instructions. But since we need to convert it into FP16, it takes another 32 instructions. Now let's see what the introduction of the vector instruction facilitated us with. This slide shows the implementation details at SOC 2. So when we started the development of at SOC 2, the RISC-V already had its vector extension RVV, which uses its own vector register file 
It has the ELML feature, which is adaptive lane sizing that we completely utilized. And it also uh, supports native operations on the data types mentioned, 8, 16, 32, and float 16 and 32. We were able to piggyback on this ELML concept to create a dedicated register file for our ten tensor extensions, and this were in 2D form, which means now we could use loads and stores to load submatrices in these 2D registers. The combination of RVV with its uh, vector register file and ELML feature, along with the tensor extensions with a 2D register, enabled us to drastically reduce the number of instructions which are required to implement this kernel. As you see on the right-hand side, to load quantized weights, which are several lines of quantized weights, uh, took only a few instructions, similarly the offsets and scales. And now the computation were performed by part of the tensor instruction operations in FP16. So there was no need to convert it down because they were performed in FP16. So this slide summarizes our experiences of uh, uh, implementing this dequantization kernel, which is for optimizing these LLM models. So although the four-bit quantization was new, the flexibility of the ISA was enough to allow us to implement our own SIMD extensions in absence of the vector instruction from the ISA. Since the problem is inherently more memory bound, even if we needed large number of instructions for one input byte, the performance was still good. And thanks to our you know, general purpose hardware software core design based on RISC V, we were able to keep uh, evolving and adapting to the industry changes in AI. The addition of the RVV helped us tremendously, uh, as, we, as I mentioned, the features of ELML, the packed vector registers, along with the fact that we were able to create a 2D register, which is literally piggybacking on the vector register file, we were able to drastically reduce the number of instruction and optimize for performance. One, it helped with reducing the pressure on the front end. Two, the instruction cache utilization greatly improved. Three, we were able to overlap both the compute and the prefetching of data in a very, very efficient manner, leading to better performance. This is a high-level view of our compute fabric. Um, it's a scalable, configurable, RISC-V-based, general-purpose compute fabric. It facilitates ease of software programming, facilitates tuning. Oh. There we go. Sorry. Let's give a hand to Jayesh. That was amazing. Yeah.